This is a CBS News special report. I'm Errol Barnett in New York City. It is mission accomplished for Virgin Galactic, led by company founder and British billionaire Richard Branson. Just moments ago, the rocket plane, his rocket plane, touched down in New Mexico after a successful flight to the edge of space and back. This aircraft flew about 50,000 feet above the Earth's surface. Richard Branson and those on board would have experienced about four minutes of weightlessness, and at that altitude, they would have been able to see the curvature of the Earth. Also on board for you will show you pilots David McKay and Michael Masucci, crew members Beth Moses, the chief astronaut instructor, Colin Bennett, lead operations engineer, and Shrisha Bandla, vice president of government affairs and research operations. Now, this flight took off just this morning from uh, Spaceport America in New Mexico. It's uh, south of Albuquerque. The launch had been pushed back, though, 90 minutes from its original start time because of weather the conditions overnight. There was a lot of anxiety about this test flight, but today's weather was favorable. The rocket plane, which you see there called Unity, is about the size of an executive jet. Branson founded Virgin Galactic to provide adventurous tourists with rides on this rocket powered plane to the edge of space and back, and that was. 17 years ago. So this is a culmination of a decades-long dream, and it was just the latest test flight of the craft carrying crew and passengers, including Branson himself. Our Mark Strassman has been following this historic development in New Mexico, and he joins us now. Mark, what was the atmosphere there for you and those spectators, and what comes next? Well, everybody here at Virgin Galactic, uh, this space company that's had its shining moment today, everybody here has to just be over the moon. I mean, let's face it, everything went picture per perfect. From the moment the mothership, the twin fuselage mothership, left the runway here and through their consequences and started lifting off to the sky, it all went spectacularly. And then the real first spectacular moment was when the mothership released uh, the released Unity 22, the spaceship, which then rocketed up to about 50 miles above Earth, and the astronauts, the now astronauts, the four civilians, uh, went ahead and they experienced several minutes of weightlessness. Then they came back to Earth, uh, glided into the runway, the landing, like the takeoff, picture perfect, uh, all very, very special, just the way uh, Richard Branson uh, must have hoped it would. You know, clearly for Branson, this is a personal milestone and a professional one, but it, uh, it is also meaningful for anyone who has a passion for space, for anyone who believes that the sky is the limit, uh, because at this point, it is now conceivable for civilians to go to Earth, to go up to space from Earth. Civilians with more money than most, perhaps, but at least it is possible. It wasn't really before today. And in the battle of the space billionaires, we have Elon Musk, you have Jeff Bezos, you have Richard Branson. Today, at least, Branson has the bragging rights. He got there first. Bezos launches on July 20th in his own uh, Virgin, uh, Virgin, his own um, Blue Origin capsule. But it's again, this is a new era in space. Commercial space travel is, is it seems as though it is not only an emerging market, but a market with moments like this that is here to stay. Errol? And Mark, uh, we appreciate you speaking to us as the music was kind of blaring there behind you. But can we also note how some are comparing this billionaire race to space to what wealthy guys do in the suburbs, getting the newest and shiniest lawnmower? I mean, Richard Branson moved up his launch to put himself on this spacecraft after it was announced Jeff Bezos with his own Blue Origin space flight company was supposed to launch um, later this summer. Talk to me about the competitive nature of these billionaires behind all of this. Well, they, they didn't get to be worth what they're worth today by being passive people. I mean, they are competitive, obviously, not only uh, in business and life, but in now with each other. This is a new age, uh, the age of space barons, and uh, there are a number of firsts that are be, have to be established. One of them was which one of these guys is going to get up there first, and it turns out it's, it's Richard Branson. And yes, for now, in this first phase of, of uh, commercial space and space tourism, it really is for rich guys. There's no doubt about it. But the hope is that over time, the fleets will expand, the number of flights will expand, and in turn, the price will come down. Maybe not within striking distance of most people, but certainly come down. For instance, uh, Virgin Galactic has a waiting list right now of uh, 600 people. They've each paid up to a quarter million dollars apiece for their chance at space. Branson hopes to give that to them starting next year. Uh, the ch chances are that the, that the Virgin Galactic's uh, waiting list is going to reopen now. The price will probably be even higher 
But again, over time, the hope is the, the number of fleets expand, economies of scale kick in, and the price begins to come down and make it more affordable for more people. We also heard as we were watching what was a, a really well orchestrated presentation here. I mean, the, uh, the company had live cuts of, of shots inside the spacecraft, showing Richard Branson on board, showing what he was saying. For, at one moment, he said, this is the experience of a lifetime. He says he was able to look out of the window and see the spaceport there in New Mexico. And he used that opportunity to thank the staff, the scientists, and, and the, all the technical folks who were able to make this happen and pull this off. Um, what about the anxiety on, on the ground as something that could be deadly and dangerous was unfolded? Who are the folks who have come there to, to celebrate and be part of this? And what have you been hearing from them today? Well, a number of uh, VIPs and guests are behind me, uh, including uh, Elon Musk, who was here in person to watch uh, Richard Blanson uh, take off today. Uh, there is, uh, a, there seems to be a, a friendly competitiveness between those two. Uh, Bezos, Jeff Bezos, the uh, the founder of Blue Origin, he on his Instagram account he wished uh, Richard Branson well in his flight today, and that wish came true for for Bezos and of course for Richard Branson in particular. It's going to be very, very interesting to see what happens from here. Bezos takes off and is supposed to take off in nine days. Assuming his flight goes well, what happens after that? Uh, what these, all these entrepreneurs want to do is establish a regular service that uh, sends folks up to the sky. To some degree, Elon Musk has already done that. Uh, but it's been very, very expensive with, uh, with Elon Musk. But his flights are not suborbital, they're orbital. Uh, with the other two, they're talking about straightforward space tourism. Go up, come down. And that, of course, will still be a lot of money, but not nearly as much money as, as going orbitally. So it's going to be very, very interesting to see what happens in the, in the days ahead. But clearly, uh, this was a, a, a huge moment and a huge marketing moment uh, for Richard Branson, for Virgin Galactic, and for the business of space tourism in general. And the blaring music there behind you suggests, uh, kind of reflects the atmosphere and the energy of the, the success of this. That's our Mark Strassman there at the spaceport in New Mexico. Thank you very much. We also now want to hear from our own Bill Harwood, an analyst who follows all of these um, explorations of space and advancements here for us at CBS. Bill, what do you make of what we've all just witnessed? Well, you know, it's a little bit of barnstorming, as Mark was saying. This is really generating interest in this commercial spaceflight program. Uh, will that work in the long term? I think it's too early to say. Uh, tickets to fly on Virgin Galactic, for example, are expected to cost around $250,000 each. Their hope is that as more and more flights take place, as more people get interested, the cost will come down. Will it ever get to the point where anybody near average can afford to fly in space? That's probably a fairly long way away, but this is a big first step, no question about that. Uh, and obviously the next thing is to see what happens with Jeff Bezos and his company. And what is the difference between Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin? I mean, each of these billionaires trying to develop something unique. We should also mention Elon Musk's effort to get into space. space. What sets these companies apart? Well, you know, Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin have chosen very different approaches. Uh, Bezos and Blue Origin have chosen a more traditional approach with a rocket that launches a capsule up into space. The capsule then separates and floats back down to Earth under a parachute. Uh, Virgin Galactic, as we've just seen, uses a space plane. It's carried up to altitude, dropped off, flies its way to space, and then glides back to a runway landing. So the experience is probably, you have to give Virgin Galactic maybe the edge there. It's about 90 minutes from launch to landing. Uh, you get the ride up to that drop altitude and then, of course, the thrilling ride to space, whereas Blue Origin's flight is only about 10 minutes from launch to landing. But on the other hand, Blue Origin offers the biggest windows ever built into a spacecraft. You're going to get a great view there. And the Blue Origin spacecraft has an abort system built in. It has a separate rocket system that can propel a crew to safety in case of a major malfunction. So there are pluses and minuses to both sides, very different approaches. And it'll be very interesting to see how the public reacts to that and where customers go. 
Public reaction is something I'm interested in discussing with you now because as we watch this billionaire race to space and everyone at Virgin Galactic pats himself on the back for doing something successfully here, we're also speaking at a time when the United States is still suffering amid uh, the, uh, a pandemic. There's a Delta variant becoming much more common and transmissible here in the U.S. And there's massive inequality. And here we are, you and I, discussing something where folks can spend a quarter of a million dollars to be in space for a few seconds. How do these companies explain the validity and the, and the reasoning for putting so many resources and lives at risk for something that only a very few, select few of us will be able to enjoy? Well, remember, the long-term vision on their part is that, it, yes, it's expensive to start with, just like commercial aviation back in the teens and 20s was a very expensive rich person's mode of transportation. But if enough people fly, if the cost comes down far enough, it may get to the point where more and more people can fly. And we really should point out here, it's not just space tourists and wealthy civilians they're aimed at. Uh, they're expecting to fly researchers. Uh, some government astronauts are expected to fly on board these spacecraft as, as both for training and to operate microgravity experiments. Uh, so I think there's another market besides just the civilians, whether that's enough to eventually get the cost down to what you or I might think is a more reasonable figure, that remains to be seen. And as I mentioned, there have been um, lives put at risk. Virgin Galactic experienced a crash of one of its spacecraft years ago. Tell us about that, lessons learned, and how that really laid the groundwork for what we witnessed today. Yeah, you know, that, that's a really interesting point I probably should have mentioned earlier when we were talking about differences between these two companies and their approaches. Uh, the, the, the 2014 accident that killed one pilot and seriously injured another on Virgin Galactic's Enterprise space plane uh, was caused by human error. The co-pilot of that flight inadvertently uh, deployed a system too soon, and that caused a structural breakup of the aircraft. They've since modified that, of course, uh, so that that's impossible to happen today. And every flight since then, they've never had a problem with that since system. But one point to, to make here is that the Virgin Galactic spacecraft is fully human operated. It requires two pilots. There's not an autopilot on board. There's no computer control. Two human pilots fly this spacecraft from the point it drops off the carrier jet all the way back down to landing. The Blue Origin spacecraft, New Shepard, is fully automated. It is computer flown. There are no pilots on board. There are no controls on board. It is a fully automated flight from launch to landing with, as we said earlier, that uh, abort system built in to handle an emergency. So another bit, uh, you know, it's a, it's a difference in design philosophy. Uh, you know, there are those who think having a human in the loop is an advantage to handle unexpected problems. There are others who believe the computers can do a better job for a vehicle like, like New Shepard and Blue Origin. Uh, so again, another design change, a uh, difference, I should say, that, that may be a factor in how people decide to, to, to buy tickets. And Bill, just quickly, uh, before we uh, check in with our Mark Strassman there on site, what were you most nervous or anxious about watching all of this today? Well, you know, as it, someone who watches rockets take off for the past uh, more than 30 years, it's always <laughs> when the rocket motor's firing. Right. Uh, the hybrid motor that Virgin uh, Galactic uses, they had problems in its initial development. They seem to have ironed those out. They've had uh, a series of very good tests ever since. Uh, but of course, you know, when you light a rocket motor, uh, there's a lot of energy being expelled, and that's something that, that has to make you nervous. All right, Bill Harwood, our space analyst, stand by for us, please. We want to cross back now to our Mark Strassman there at the spaceport in New Mexico, depending on if the music is blaring or not. A very celebratory atmosphere there. Mark, what's happening at the moment? Well, what do you do after a big moment like this? You celebrate, which is what Virgin Galactic is going to do right now. They're going to bring everybody on board uh, to uh, get their astronaut wings. That's going to be, a, a, of course, a, a different sort of celebration. And then they're going to do press availability, celebrate the moment. Remember, this is not just a personal milestone. This is a, a major marketing moment for Richard Branson and for Virgin Galactic. And believe me, they aim to make the most of it. And along those lines, uh, for folks who are watching the live feed of this, Virgin Galactic had a very like well-produced, pre-produced package of Branson writing a letter to his late mother about um, thanking her for making him the adventurer he is. One of the lines that stood out to me was he said, the brave may not live forever, but the cautious don't live at all. What does that tell us about what motivates Branson? 
Well, and I'll tell you something else, uh, Ara, which is that, I mean, originally, Branson's idea was to take his mother with him on this first flight. Uh, but uh, what it means, essentially, is, look, you've got, you've got a guy in Richard Branson who has done things differently, who sees the world differently, who is not afraid to go after uh, yeah. visions that he has. Uh, he's, he's sort of been a swashbuckling billionaire. And this is another example of that. He's always reached higher, and today he reached higher than he ever has before. Swashbucklers for the 21st century. Mark Strassman, thank you very much. Our coverage will continue here on our 20, 24 hour streaming network, CBSN, and you can watch it at any time at cbsnews.com or on our CBS News app. There will be much more to come on this historic Virgin Galactic flight on your local news, on this CBS station, and tonight on the CBS Weekend News. This has been a CBS News special report. I'm Errol Barnett, CBS News, New York. For news 24 hours a day, go to cbsnews.com.